Chapter 29, Labors in the Tabernacle, Moorfields, London. I had accepted Dr. Campbell's cordial invitation to supply his pulpit for a time, and accordingly, after the May meetings, I put in, in earnest, for a revival. Though I said no such thing to Dr. Campbell or anybody else for some weeks, I preached a course of sermons designed to convict the people of sin as deeply and as universally as possible. I saw from Sabbath to Sabbath and from evening to evening that the word was taking great effect. On Sabbath day I preached morning and evening, and I also preached on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday evenings. On Monday evening we had a general prayer meeting in the tabernacle. At each of these prayer meetings I addressed the people on the subject of prayer. Our congregations were very large, and always on Sabbath and Sabbath evenings the house was crowded. Religion had so declined throughout London at that time that very few weekly sermons were preached, and I recollect that Dr. Campbell said to me once that he believed I preached to more people during the week evenings than all the rest of the ministers in London together. I have said that Dr. Campbell had the salary belonging to the pastor in his congregation, but this salary he did not use for himself, at least more than a part of it because he supplied the pulpit at his own expense while he performed such parochial duties as it was possible for him to perform under such a pressure of editorial labors. I found Dr. Campbell to be an earnest but a very belligerent man. He was always given to controversy. To use an American expression, he was given to pitching into everybody and everything that did not correspond with his views. In this way, he did a great deal of good, and occasionally, I fear, some harm. After preaching for several weeks in the manner that I have described, I knew that it was time to call for inquirers. But Dr. Campbell, I perceived, had no such idea in his mind. Indeed, he had not sat where he could witness what was going on in the congregation, as I could from the pulpit. And if he had done, he probably would not have understood it. The practice in that church is to hold a communion service every alternate Sabbath evening. On these occasions, they would have a short sermon, then dismiss the congregation, and all would retire except those that had tickets for the communion service who would remain while that ordinance was celebrated. On the Sabbath morning to which I have referred, I said to Dr. Campbell, You have a communion service tonight, and I must have a meeting of inquiry at the same time. Have you any room anywhere on the premises to which I can invite inquirers after preaching? He hesitated and expressed doubts whether there were any that would attend such a meeting as that. However, as I pressed the matter upon him, he replied, Yes, there is the infant schoolroom to which you might invite them. I inquired how many persons it could accommodate. He replied, From twenty to thirty, or perhaps forty. Oh, I said, that is not half large enough. Have you not a larger room? At this he expressed astonishment, and inquired if I thought that there was interest enough in the congregation to warrant any such invitation as I had intended to give. I told him there were hundreds of inquirers in the congregation, but at this he laughed and said it was impossible. I asked him if he had not a larger room. Why, yes, he said, there is the British schoolroom, but that will hold fifteen or sixteen hundred. Of course you don't want that. Yes, said I, that is the very room. Where is it? Oh, said he, surely you will not venture to appoint a meeting there. Not half as many would attend, I presume, as could get into the infant schoolroom. Said he, Mr. Finney, remember you are in England and in London, and that you are not acquainted with our people. You might get people to attend such a meeting under such a call as you propose to make in America, but you will not get people to attend here. Remember that our evening service is out before the sun is down at this time of the year. And do you suppose that in the midst of London, under an invitation to those that are seeking the salvation of their souls and are anxious on that subject, that they will single themselves out right in the daytime and under such a call as that, publicly given, to attend such a meeting as that? I replied to him, Dr. Campbell, I know what the state of the people is, better than you do. The gospel is as well adapted to the English people as to the American people and I have no fears at all that the pride of the people will prevent their responding to such a call any more than it would the people in America. I asked him to tell me where, the, where that room was, and so to specify it, that I could point it out to the people and make the appeal that I intended to make. After a good deal of discussion, the doctor reluctantly consented. 
but told me expressly that I must take the responsibility on myself, that he would not share it. I replied that I expected to take the responsibility and was prepared to do so. He then gave me particular directions about the place, which was but a little distance from the tabernacle. The people had to pass up Cowper Street toward the city road a few rods and turn through a narrow passage to the British schoolroom building. We then went to meeting, and I preached in the morning and again at evening, that is at six o'clock if I recollect the hour. I preached a short sermon and then informed the people what I desired. I called upon all who were anxious for their souls and who were then disposed immediately to make their peace with God to attend a meeting for instruction adapted to their state of mind. I was very particular in regard to the class of persons invited. I said, professors of religion are not invited to attend this meeting. There is to be a communion service here. Let them remain here. Careless sinners are not invited to this meeting. Those and only those are expected to attend who are not Christians, but who are anxious for the salvation of their souls and wish instruction given them directly upon the question of their present duty to God. This I repeated so as not to be misunderstood. Dr. Campbell listened with great attention, and I presume he expected, since I had restricted my appeal to such a class, that very few, if any, would attend. I was determined not to have the mass of the people go into that room, and furthermore, that those who did go should go with the express understanding that they were inquiring sinners. I was particular on this point, and not only for the sake of the results of the meeting, but to convince Dr. Campbell that his view of the subject was a mistaken one. I felt entirely confident that there was a great amount of conviction in the congregation and that hundreds were prepared to respond to such a call at once. I was perfectly confident that I was not premature in making such a call. I therefore proceeded very particularly to point out the class of persons whom I wished to attend and the manner in which they would find the place. I then dismissed the meeting and the congregation retired. Dr. Campbell nervously and anxiously looked out of the window to see which way the congregation went, and to his great astonishment, Cowper Street was perfectly crowded with people pressing up to get into the British schoolroom. I passed out and went up with the crowd and waited at the entrance till the multitude went in. When I entered, I found the room packed. Dr. Campbell's impression was that there was not less than fifteen or sixteen hundred present. It was a large room, seated with forms or benches, such as are often used in schoolrooms. There was near the entrance a platform on which the speakers stood, whenever they had a public meeting, which was of frequent occurrence. I soon discovered that the congregation were pressed with conviction in such a manner that great care needed to be taken to prevent an explosion of irrepressible feeling. It was but a very short time before Dr. Campbell came in himself. Observing such a crowd gather, he was full of anxiety to be present, and consequently hastened through with his communion services and came into the meeting of inquiry. He looked amazed at the crowd present, and especially at the amount of feeling manifested. I addressed them for a short time on the question of immediate duty, and endeavored, as I always do, to make them understand that God required of them then to yield themselves entirely to His will, to ground their weapons of rebellion, make their submission to Him as their rightful sovereign, and accept Jesus as their only Redeemer. I had been in England long enough to feel the necessity of being very particular in giving them such instructions as, as would do away their idea of waiting God's time. London is, and long has been, cursed with hyper-Calvinistic preaching. I therefore aimed my remarks at the subversion of those ideas, in which I supposed many of them had been educated. For but few persons present, I suppose, belonged properly to Dr. Campbell's congregation. Indeed, he had himself told me that the congregation which he saw from day to day was new to him, that the masses who were thronging there were as much unknown to him as they were to me. I tried, therefore, in my instructions to guard them on the one hand against hyper-Calvinism and on the other against that low Arminianism in which I suppose many of them had been educated. I then, after I had laid the gospel net thoroughly around them, prepared to draw it ashore, as I was about to ask them to kneel down and commit themselves entirely and forever to Christ, a man cried out in the midst of the congregation, in the greatest distress of mind, 
that he had sinned away his day of grace. I saw that there was danger of an uproar, and I hushed it down as best I could, and called on the people to kneel down, but to keep so quiet if possible that they could hear every word of the prayer that I was about to offer. They did, by a manifest effort, keep so still as to hear what was said, although there was a great sobbing and weeping in every part of the house. I then dismissed the meeting. After this, I held similar meetings with similar results, frequently on Sabbath evening, while I remained with that congregation, which was in all nine months. The interest rose and extended so far that the inquirers could not be accommodated in that large British schoolroom. And frequently when I saw that the impression on the congregation was very general and deep, after giving them suitable instructions and bringing them face to face with the question of unqualified and present surrender of all to Christ, I would call on those that were prepared in mind to do this, to stand up in their places while we offered them to God in prayer. The aisles in that house were so narrow and so packed that it was impossible to use what is called the anxious seat or for people to move about at all in the congregation. Frequently, when I made these calls for people to arise and offer themselves while we offered them in prayer, many hundreds would arise, and on some occasions, if the house seated as many as was supposed, not less than 2,000 people sometimes arose when an appeal was made. Indeed, it would appear from the pulpit as if nearly the whole congregation arose, and yet I did not call upon church members, but simply upon inquirers to stand up and commit themselves to God. In the midst of the work, a circumstance occurred which will illustrate the extent of the religious interest connected with that congregation at that time. The circumstance to which I allude was this. The dissenters in England had been for a good while endeavoring to persuade the government to have more respect in their action than they were wont to do to the dissenting interest in that country. But they had always been answered in a way that implied that the dissenting interest was small as compared with that of the established church. So much had been said on this subject that the government determined to take measures to ascertain the relative strength of the two parties, that is, of the dissenters and of the Church of England. On a certain Saturday night, without any previous warning or notice whatever that should lead the people anywhere to understand or even suspect the movement, a message was secretly sent to every place of worship in the kingdom, requesting that individuals should be selected to stand at the doors of all the churches and chapels and places of worship in the whole kingdom on the next Sabbath morning to take the census of all that entered houses of worship of every denomination. Such a notice was sent to Dr. Campbell but I did not know it till afterward. In obedience to directions, he placed men at every door of the tabernacle with instructions to count every person that went in during the morning service. This was done, as I understood, throughout the whole of Great Britain. In this way, they ascertained the relative strength of the two parties. In other words, which had the most worshippers on Sabbath, the dissenters or the established church? I believe this census proved that the dissenters were in a majority. But however this may be, Dr. Campbell told me that the men stationed at the doors of the tabernacle reported several thousands more than could be any one time get in, into the house, that could at any one time get into the house. This arose from the fact that multitudes entered the doors and finding no place to sit or stand would give place to others. The interest was so great that a place of worship that would hold many thousands would have been just as full as the tabernacle. Whence they all came, Dr. Campbell did not know, and no one could tell. But that hundreds and thousands of them were converted, there is no reason to doubt. Indeed, I saw and, converted with vast, and conversed with vast numbers, and labored in this way to the full limit of my strength. On Saturday evening, inquirers and converts would come to the study for conversation. Great numbers came every week, and conversations multiplied. People came, as I learned, from every part of the city. Many people walked several miles every Sabbath to attend the meetings. Soon I began to be accosted in the streets in different parts of the city by people who knew me and had been greatly blessed in attendance in attending our meetings. Indeed, the Word of God was blessed, greatly blessed in London at that time. One day, Dr. Campbell requested me to go in and make a few remarks to the scholars in the British schoolroom. I did so, and began by asking them what they proposed to do with their education, and dwelt upon their responsibility in that respect. 
I tried to show them how much good they might do, how great a blessing their education would be to them and to the world if they used it aright, and what a great curse it would be to them and to the world if they used it selfishly. The address was short, but that point was strongly urged upon them. Dr. Campbell afterwards remarked to me that a goodly number, I forget how many now, had been received to the church who were at that time awakened and led to seek the salvation of their souls. He mentioned it as a remarkable fact because he said he had no expectation that such a result would follow. The fact is that the ministers in England, as well as in this country, had lost sight in a great measure of the necessity of pressing present obligations home upon the consciences of the people. Why, said Dr. Campbell when he told me of this, I don't understand it. You did not say anything but what anybody else might have said just as well. Yes, I replied, they might have said it, but would they have said it? Would they have made as direct and pointed an appeal to the consciences of those young people as I did? This is the difficulty. Ministers talk about sinners and do not make the impression that God commands them now to repent, and thus they throw their ministry away. Indeed, I seldom hear a sermon that seems to be constructed with the intention of bringing sinners at once face to face with their present duty to God. You would scarcely get the idea from the sermons that are heard, either in this country or in England, that ministers expect or intend to be instrumental in converting at the time anybody in the house. A fact was related to me some time ago that will illustrate what I have just said. Two young men who were acquaintances but had very differing views of preaching the gospel were settled over congregations at no great distance from each other. One of them had a powerful revival in his congregation and the other had none. One was having continual accessions to his church and the other none. They met one day and he who had no accession to his church inquired of his brother the cause of the difference between them and asked if he might take one of his sermons and preach it to the people and see if it had any different effect from his own. The arrangement was made and he preached the borrowed sermon to his people. It was a sermon, though written, yet constructed for the purpose of bringing sinners face to face with their duty to God. At the close of the service he saw that many were very much affected, and remained in their seats weeping. He therefore made a profound apology, saying he hoped he had not hurt their feelings, for he did not intend it. My own mind was greatly exercised in view of the moral desolation of that vast city of London. The places of worship in the city, as I learned, were sufficient to accommodate only a small part of the inhabitants. But I was greatly interested in a movement that sprang up among the Episcopalians. Numbers of their ministers came in and attended our meetings. One of the rectors, a Mr. Allen, became very much engaged and made up his mind that he would try to promote a revival in his own great parish. As he afterwards informed me, he went around and established twenty prayer meetings in his parish at different points. He went to preaching with all his might directly to the people. The Lord greatly blessed his labors, and before I left, he informed me that not less than 1,500 persons had been hopefully converted in his parish. Several other Episcopal ministers were greatly stirred up and quickened in their souls and went to holding protracted or continuous services. When I left London, there were four or five different Episcopal churches that were holding daily meetings and making efforts to promote a revival. In every instance, I believe, they were greatly blessed and refreshed. It was ten years before I visited London again to labor, and I was told that the work had never ceased, that it had been going on and enlarging its borders and spreading in different directions. I found many of the converts the second time I visited there laboring in different parts of London in various ways and with great success. I have said my mind was greatly exercised about the state of London. I was scarcely ever more drawn out in prayer for any city or place than I was for London. Sometimes when I prayed, in public especially, it seemed, with the multitudes before me, as if I could not stop praying, and that the spirit of prayer would almost draw me out of myself in pleadings for the people and for the city at large. I had hardly more than arrived in England before I began to receive multitudes of invitations to preach for the purpose of taking up collections for different objects, to pay the pastor's salary, to help pay for a chapel, or to raise money for the Sabbath school, or for some such object. I had complied with their requests, I could have done nothing else, but I declined to go in answer to any such call. I told them I had not come to England to get money for myself or for them. My object was to win souls to Christ. 
After I had preached for Dr. Campbell about four months and a half, I became very hoarse, and my wife's health also became much affected by the climate and by our intense labors. And here I must commence more particularly a recital of what God did by her. Up to this time she had attended and taken part only in meetings for women, and those were so new a thing in England that she had done but little thus far in that way. But while we were at Dr. Campbell's, a request was made that she would attend a tea meeting of poor women without education and without religion. Tea meetings, as they are called, are held in England to bring together people for any special object. Such a meeting was called by some of the benevolent Christian gentlemen and ladies, and my wife was urgently requested to attend it. She consented, having no thought that gentlemen would remain in the meeting while she made her address. However, when she got there and she found the place crowded, and in addition to the women a considerable number of gentlemen who were greatly interested in the results of the meeting, she waited a little, expecting that they would retire, but as they remained and expected her to take charge of the meeting, she arose and, I believe, apologized for being called to speak in public, informing them that she had never been in the habit of doing so. She had then been my wife for a little but more than a year, and had never been abroad with me to labor in revivals until we went to England. She made an address at this meeting, and she inquired me, after she came to our lodgings, of about three-quarters of an hour in length. Rather, she made an address at this meeting, as she informed me after she came to our lodgings, of about three-quarters of an hour in length, and with very manifest good results. The poor women present seemed to be greatly moved and interested, and when she had done speaking, some of the gentlemen present arose and expressed their great satisfaction at what they had heard. They said they had had prejudices against women speaking in public, but they could see no objection to it under such circumstances, and they saw that it was manifestly calculated to do great good. They therefore requested her to attend other similar meetings, which she did. When she returned, she told me what she had done, and said that she did not know, but it would excite the prejudices of the people of England, and perhaps do more harm than good. I feared this myself, and so expressed myself to her. Yet I believe I did not advise her to keep still, and not attend any more such meetings, but after more consideration, I encouraged it. From that time she became more and more accustomed, while we remained in England, to that kind of labor, and after we returned home, she continued to labor with her own sex wherever she went. Upon this I shall have occasion to enlarge when I speak of the revivals in which she bore a very prominent part. There were a great number of most interesting cases of conversion in London at that time, from almost all classes of society. I preached a great deal on confession and restitution, the results of which were truly wonderful. Almost every form of crime was thus searched out and confessed. Hundreds and I believe thousands of pounds of sterling were paid over to make restitution. Everyone acquainted with London is aware that from early in November till the next March the city is very gloomy and has a miserable atmosphere either to breathe or to speak in. We went there early in May. In September, my friend Brown of Houghton called on us, and seeing the state of health that we were both in, he said, This will never do. You must go to France or somewhere on the continent where they cannot understand your language, for there is no rest for you in England as long as you are able to speak at all. After talking the matter over, we concluded to take his advice and go for a little while to France. He handed me fifty pounds sterling to meet our expenses. We went to Paris and various other places in France. We sedulously avoided making any acquaintances and kept ourselves as quiet as possible. The influence of the change of climate upon my wife's health was very marked. She recovered her full tone of strength very rapidly. I gradually got over my hoarseness, and after an absence of about six weeks, we returned to our labors in the tabernacle, where we continued to labor till early in the next April, when we left for home. I left England with great reluctance, but the prosperity of our college seemed to require that I should return. We had become greatly interested in the people of England, and desired very much to remain there and protract our labors. We sailed in a large packet ship, the Southampton, from London. On the day that we sailed, a multitude of people who had been interested in our labors gathered upon the wharf. A great majority of them were young converts. The ship had to wait for the tide, and for several hours there was a vast crowd of people in the open space around the ship waiting to see us off. 
Tearing away from such a multitude of loving hearts completely overcame the strength of my wife. As soon as the ship was clear of the dock, she retired to our stateroom. I remained upon the deck and watched the waving of handkerchiefs until we were swept down the river out of sight. Thus closed our labors in England on our first visit there.